And I think forgiveness is one of the most significant facilitators of spiritual and psychological transformation. And so forgiveness will be discussed in light of two case studies uh, that include forgiveness of another and also forgiveness of oneself. And in one example, uh, the client incorporated a forgiving ritual to initiate her spiritual transformation and in the other there was a spontaneous experience of transcendent intervention that just happened um, that obviously was a peak experience uh, and it certainly promoted healing and development and then finally some implications for therapy and increasing spiritual sensitivity and clinical practice are explored. So, some of the terms. Uh, spirituality. Um, I think, unfortunately, spirituality has been culturally and, relig and rigidly understood as the province of clergy, preoccupied with heavenly salvation rather than earthly delight. Uh, I think it's obviously something more than religion. Uh, Laguerre, different differentiated spirituality from religion and asserted that spirituality is an experience whereas religion transforms that experience into a concept. Spirituality is personal. It's a subjective experience of the transcendent or the divine or religion refers to the specific and concrete expression of spirituality. Another understanding is that spirituality uh, includes certain positive inward qualities and perceptions while avoiding implications of narrow dogmatic beliefs and obligatory, or obligatory religious observances. Um, so my belief is that spirituality is not dependent upon religion but is alive in, at least, uh, yes, I'll just say that, but is alive in as well as outside of religion alive in as well as outside of religion. And it's an in integral part of every human being. Uh, if you recall, Maslow was not impressed with traditional organized religion, but he certainly was concerned about spiritual values. And we have lots of researchers out there like Alkines and Ingersoll who identify spiritual values in human life such as meaning and purpose, sacredness, altruism, mystery play, Authenticity, love, truth, and connection to the cosmos and to God. There's this association for spiritual, ethical, and religious values in counseling, which is a nice, long uh, title for a, a group. And they had a summit about eight years ago and came up with this definition of spirituality. It's a capacity and tendency that is innate and unique to all persons that moves the individual towards love, or towards knowledge, love, meaning, hope, transcendence, connectedness, and compassion. Spirituality includes one capacity for creativity, growth, and development of a value system. And if you read about spirituality, you'll also run across other terms that are, that are used somewhat synonymously, like sanity. Sanctity, serenity, health, wholeness, holiness. And Kurtz points out that the goal of spirituality is the alleviation of mental, emotional, and spiritual distress, thought to be at least in part caused by the lack of an appropriate, by the lack of an appropriate relationship with ultimate reality, most often singled by and reflected in inappropriate relationships with other people and things. Those are some thoughts about spirituality. Psychotherapy. Um, um, let's see. I've been counseling for, or I've been, been a practitioner, let me put it that way, uh, for almost 20 years. Hard to believe. I'm older than I look. <laughs> uh, and um, recently I've been struck with this term psychotherapy and I've, I, I mean, sometimes that's an intimidating term and people go, ooh, psychotherapy, as opposed to counseling, you know. Uh, but I'm, 
kind of connecting to it, uh, mostly because I've discovered that um, the, the term has some interesting meaning if you look at the roots of the term. So I choose the term intentionally. People suffer and desire relief. And the term psychotherapy is derived from Greek words for psyche, which refers to the mind or the soul, and therapia, which means one who serves the gods or heals. Hmm. I like that because the connotation is that psychotherapy is the process of promoting spiritual intervention or enlisting the divine in an effort to heal both the human mind and soul. And even in our scientific age, psychotherapy cannot manage to escape its more basic roots of meaning. And so, in agreement with Steer, who wrote Spiritual Presence in Psychotherapy, a guide for caregivers, I believe that all people are seeking to meet at least two basic needs. One is spiritual direction, a sense of inner fulfillment, or satisfying devotion to something sacred, something that brings meaning and purpose to their lives. And the second is healing. And that doesn't mean just physical or emotional healing, but wholeness, a sense of well-being that comes from facing our vicissitudes and coping with the estrangement that can overwhelm our personal relationships as couples, friends, uh, families, and co-workers. And I'll just remind you that the word wholeness um, is the root meaning of the word holy. Um, so, indelibly linked to the process of psychotherapy or of helping another gain healing of mind and soul are the spiritual therapeutic agents, hope and care. There are probably more, but these are two that I think are really important. And what is hope? I thought I'd throw this in because Mary, Mary Pfeiffer is here this weekend, so I, I, I read somewhere that she said there's no such thing as false hope. Because it's a bit of contradiction in terms, right? Um, hope has been described as having two components. Uh, Snyder, I don't know if you've heard of Snyder, the psychology of hope. Uh, he talks about hope as having at least two elements, and the element of hope that people speak of when they become inspired is one component, sometimes called will or willpower, as in the will to recover or learn to live, or, or learn or live. Hope promotes the promise of healing. The second component of hope is wayfulness. This hope is attached to something or someone. People place their hope or their trust, their confidence in another or in an agent. At times, this kind of hope is invested in something more ultimate like a higher power, God. This hope promotes faith and meaning despite circumstance. So instilling hope for healing by trusting the change process demonstrates the spiritual nature of psychotherapy. Hope that inspires and hope um, as, a, as a promise of healing and hope in you, and hope in some force that can promote change. Psychotherapy is also motivated by an immersion in the experience of care. Even though humans are naturally self-centered and lazy, uh, compassion and care have been extended from one person to another before shepherds tended their flocks or before Hippocrates pledged to care for his patients. So relying on a Judeo-Christian perspective, which is the one I come from, perhaps care happens because God cares for all people and all creation and that we should somehow share in this task through care for one another. The act of caring forms the core of spiritual life and is the activity from which we approach mystical spiritual encounter and the activity to which we return to shape our communal relationships. As we care, we become more spiritually connected to those seeking relief and to the origin of care, the transcendent. God. So we've talked about spirituality, we've talked about psychotherapy, and then the third term is spiritual transformation. And Benjamin and Loby suggest that spiritual development is the process of growth strengthened by one spiritual experience after another, which ultimately leads to spiritual transformation. 
Spiritual development takes time and may require numerous spiritual experiences. Uh, these authors go on to state that spiritual transformation is achieved when the client adapts not only a new frame of reference, but also a new way of life in thought, action, and spirit. So, in a way, spiritual transformation in psychotherapy can be understood as like a conversion experience, like a, a new direction, letting go of the past and becoming a new person in terms of how one responds to oneself and to others. This kind of transformation acknowledges or requires acknowledging the truth about oneself and one's past. Which reminds me of Jesus' words, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, which I think capture the essence of psychotherapeutic change experience. Self-exploration at this level exposes a person to his or her personal deficits and or defenses, and paradoxically commences development of spiritual perspective. Maslow talks about that. Jungian psychology would, would concur with this perspective because Jung talked about the healthiest people stop denying their shadow, their dark side. In fact, he says they make friends with their shadow in order to um, identify their defenses and scrutinize their defenses and then find the courage to let go of that familiar and pseudo-protective lifeline. So surrendering or relinquishing the past enables the client to be open to new experience. Okay, now we get to the spiritually based psychotherapy assumptions. And I, uh, I credit Anderson and Worthen, who identify three assumptions that are based on spirituality. And the first assumption, which has been implied, uh, but now stated directly, is that God or a divine being exists. And I believe humans have a sense of being surrounded by an unseen order. William James called it the more. <laughs> uh, this first assumption implies that all human beings possess an innate capacity to experience this spiritual reality. Second assumption, posited by Anderson and Worthen, is that humankind innately yearns for connection with this being, or God. This belief suggests that people have an inner restlessness or longing to fulfill one's sense of personal incompleteness by connecting with the transcendent. Gerald May, I think it's in his book, um, Great Addiction and Grace, uh, calls this yearning the essence of the human spirit or a universal and primary desire for an actual loving communion, even union, in an absolutely personal relationship with God. And the final assumption of spiritually or spiritual based psychotherapy is that this transcendent being is interested in humans and acts upon and within their persons and relationships to promote beneficial change. In other words, God can intervene on the behalf of humans to aid the healing of souls and minds. Okay. Third thing to talk about is forgiveness, which I think is a key facilitator and is kind of the focus of the rest of this paper. It's my belief that spirituality gives psychotherapy ultimate meaning and that forgiveness is one of the most powerful forces or interventions promoting healing and freedom to grow. While it's important to acknowledge that forgiveness is not a panacea, it is not a cure-all. It doesn't mean that once forgiveness occurs, everything is wonderful. Um, and it's also important to acknowledge that appropriate timing, as well as developmental readiness. I don't think it's therapeutic to say you need to forgive, or forgiveness is key here when people aren't ready or when, um, you know, the timing is inappropriate. Uh, so, appropriate timing as well as developmental readiness to take this courageous step is essential. Uh, forgiveness promotes a sense of liberation, reconnection, and hope for the future. So forgiveness is complex, frequently confusing, and usually difficult. 
I'm not going to talk too much about the process. I'm going to talk more about the experience. Uh, forgiveness is not, among other things, condoning, pardoning, excusing, denying, forgetting, or conciliation. Uh, Aponte points out that it is as difficult to forgive as it is to love, always. However, forgiveness is a force that heals and builds, while non-forgiveness, if we could coin that term, I looked it up, I couldn't find it, but let's say it, it's a term. Non-forgiveness divides and destroys. To forgive brings peace and rest, while non-forgiveness fosters turmoil and unsettledness. Forgiveness promotes love and openness towards ourselves and others. Non-forgiveness destroys the spirit of care within us and between us by holding on uh, to anger and resentment. Forgiveness facilitates warmth that stimulates growth. Non-forgiveness leads to coldness and shuts us down. There are various perspectives on forgiveness. Um, Hargrave and Sells indicate that forgiveness usually refers to releasing resentment towards an offender, restoring relationships and healing inner emotional wounds, or releasing the person who caused an injury from potential retaliation. And this demarcation of forgiveness promotes the concept of reconciliation between an offender and a wrong party. And that's a really important part of forgiveness. It's not the part I want to emphasize. But, um, so, although forgiveness can restore relationships, I do not believe that this is the universal goal of forgiveness. Because forgiveness is always possible while not all relationships continue to be viable. I don't know um, what you think, but that makes sense to me. Worthington says that forgiveness requires empathy for the offender, the humility to see oneself as fallible and needy as the offender, and the courage to commit publicly to forgive. So the desire to understand the offender's anguish that might have promoted his or her harmful actions is a noble and at times achievable goal. However, this comprehension of forgiveness can sometimes be at odds with the emotional needs of the victim. And, and while I think that would be something to pursue, it's not necessary for forgiveness. Another understanding of forgiveness includes remorse on the part of the offender and that the wrongdoer accepts responsibility for the injustice, giving the opportunity for compensation. And this approach seems to put a premium on victims or clients retaining power in the relationship by ensuring that they offer forgiveness only when the perpetrator of wrong becomes accountable and justice or recompense as they see it occurs. And I think that's a limited view of forgiveness. So, although the views expect, or expressed above lend meaning to comprehending forgiveness, in my view, these perspectives can be limited to specific situations. And so, a more comprehensive understanding of forgiveness from a spiritual psychotherapeutic stance is directly related to all those who forgive and includes two basic themes that I'd like to promote. First, at its core, forgiveness is a freely made intention to let go of pain, bitterness, resentment, and anger to which we hold another. It's important to acknowledge that these intense negative feelings also restrict the forgiver's growth and development. So the desire to let go or relinquish the emotional wounding grows out of a commitment to free oneself as well as the other from the bondage of the grievous depth of hurt. When one forgives, it is always the forgiver who benefits and changes, even though the act is interpersonal. So, it, it sounds a little uh, egocentric, but when I forgive, I'm really benefiting myself. And uh, <clears throat> I'm letting go of things that get in, my, in the way of my growth. And secondly, forgiving someone for an offense places the responsibility for the harmful behavior where it belongs. Uh, whether or not the perpetrator of wrong accepts personal accountability for his or her abusive actions, through forgiveness, the offended person relinquishes the notion that the abuse was deserved and, the, and that person is relieved of self-recrimination. In the same light, 
forgiveness is not dependent upon the recipient's ability to own the wrong or to ask for forgiveness. So forgiveness is a gift to oneself because it is alternative self-punishment. It can be accomplished independent of the offender and it promotes transcending the, the transgression. So whether or not the perpetrator asks for forgiveness, accepts responsibility, uh, does not depend on somebody's ability to forgive. In other words, I can forgive regardless of that person's response. So because of the uniqueness of spiritual experience in psychotherapy, I'll attempt to ground my exploration of forgiveness in two case studies. And we'll talk about these and then briefly reflect on the spiritually transforming power of forgiveness and some applications for participating in psychotherapy that is sensitive to the spiritual. Um, both of these people have um, consented to having their cases presented. There are things that are changed so that you would not be able to identify who they are, but obviously the core experience is true to, to their experience. So we'll start with Jane. Jane was a 35-year-old mother of three daughters who had been married for 10 years. Feeling depressed, guilty, hurt, anxious, and angry, she presented several issues for psychotherapy. At age 10, <clears throat> she had suffered emotional and sexual abuse from a man she knew as her father. Sexual intimacy currently with her husband was infrequent, and her lack of sexual responsiveness left them both feeling frustrated, tired, and skeptical of hope for intimacy. And of course, Jane believed it was her fault, and he deserved better. She was full of guilt. Her alcoholic mother minimized problems hid behind her drug of choice and had trouble acknowledging Jane's sexual abuse or that she had married a man others had warned her might sexually manipulate her daughters. She had been more warned before she married this guy that he was probably a predator, but she was in denial. Jane desired better boundaries with her mother and her sisters so that she could be more honest with them and feel less responsible for their responses. The crisis that precipitated her visits with me was that Jane's oldest daughter was suddenly acting clingy, dependent, and anxious. And Jane believed that she was passing on her problems to her daughter and she didn't know how to be a good enough mom. So due to her tendency to be over-responsible for those in her life, Jane initiated therapy mostly out of concern for her daughter's problems. Um, Jane also felt discouraged as a Christian and experienced God as distant. So Jane was uncertain, so just a few other things about her background. Jane was uncertain whether her mother's ex-husband or the man that her mother married when she was two was her biological father. She didn't really know. And her mother would not identify her real father, so she lived with some confusion about her roots and identity. Jane believed that one of her older sisters uh, was also sexually molested by her father because she was the favored sister and she was smart and beautiful and so on. But Jane's sister rejected any sexual, that any sexual abuse occurred and that bothered Jane because <laughs> at times it seemed then that it would make her question her own experience. It didn't happen to her. I wonder if it really happened to me. Jane had no contact with her husband's ex-husband, but saw her mothers and sisters regularly. Her father died nine years prior to our time. Jane had engaged in counseling previously with her husband. The focus had been on her past and her dysfunctional family. That's what her husband called her family and she had exited fairly quickly. The crisis with her daughter compelled her to try therapy again. She was not very optimistic about resolving her problems. Uh, so psychotherapy commenced with me affirming her for exhibiting enough courage and self-care to come. Um, the first several sessions were spent exploring, clarifying, validating her legitimate feelings over the events in her life. We did discuss some different parenting approaches with her daughter 
Jane and I processed how she could own and authenticate her feelings regardless of others' acceptance or response to them. In her fifth meeting, she stated that she knew that what her father had done to her was still affecting her, but she just couldn't let it go. I asked her if she had forgiven him. Her response was that he had never accepted responsibility for what he had done. He was already dead, and besides, she didn't know if he deserved forgiveness. So then I asked her if she deserved the guilt, hurt, anger, and insecurity that unforgiveness was using to punish her and keep her from being free to love and be intimate. And she had not considered that forgiving another resulted in freeing her to move forward and trust herself and others. And so as we discussed her experience of letting go of the harm that her father had caused, we decided that she would write a letter of forgiveness to her father. This was a pivotal point in psychotherapy. It marked the date that she referred to as a conversion experience. And so with Jane's generous permission, I'm honored to share this letter with you. This is one of the most moving letters forgiveness I've ever read. Uh, I was teaching a class earlier this summer on spirituality and psychology, and I read this letter, and it, it overwhelmed me. So we'll see if I can read this. Uh, and by the way, uh, she knows that her letter has been read in various places, and, and, and it, it encourages her when other people uh, feel moved by her letter. So here's her letter. Dad, I loved you and you used me. I trusted you and you betrayed me. I needed you and you took advantage of my need, my want, my loving, or my longing to be loved, to be intimate. You took and gave me ashes. I just wanted to be close to you. You were big and strong. I wanted protection. You exposed me, then you rejected me. I wanted to run and play and be carefree to laugh. You made me feel responsible for your sin. Guilty for not making you happy. Guilty for wanting. Guilty for not giving you what you wanted. Guilty for taking you away from mom. Guilty for betraying mom. You made me feel guilty for the response my body gave to your touch. Guilty for the pleasure I felt. I've hated my body for responding to you and felt separated from my God given sexuality, God's gift to me to share with my husband. Hate is a soft word which doesn't come close to the way I felt about myself. Then I felt more guilt for hating what God created. God created me. Dad, you left me ashamed, guilty, fearful, rejected, confused, responsible, out of control. Why didn't you cherish me, Dad? You exploited me for your own pleasure, your own power. I'm tired of taking responsibility for your sin, Dad. You chose to take advantage of my trust and innocence. You may have been abused too, but that doesn't excuse you anymore. You made a choice to abuse me. I didn't want it. The things I wanted from you were God-given human needs, a child's need for love, my need for love. Dad, I have a boulder of guilt and shame and anger. I give you my shackles. I give you my bondage. It was never mine to carry. Your sin, your guilt. Before God and my husband, I give you full responsibility, Dad. You carry it to the cross, Dad. I have taken this to God so many times, he didn't take it because it wasn't mine to give. I'm innocent. I forgive you, Dad, and I'm going to keep forgiving you. I'm taking my life back, Dad. <clears throat> I take back my need for love. I take back my innocence. I take back my sexuality. I will take back my ability to love and I take back my beauty. I take back my dignity. I take back my honor and my self-respect. I will learn to live these things out daily in my life and in the lives of my husband and children. I will be free. That's a powerful letter. Um, well, yeah. Uh, well, freer. I mean, it was part of Things changed. Uh, so, when I asked Jane what this letter meant to her, she focused on, on these words in the letter. Before God and my husband, I give you full responsibility, Dad. You carry it to the cross. 
I've taken this to God so many times and he didn't take it because it wasn't mine to give. <laughs> and I take my life back, I will be free. Those were the central things in her experience. Uh, powerful, powerful, moving words. She stated that forgiving her dad placed the responsibility for the abuse where it belonged and she could stop punishing herself for what he had done. This forgiving experience was key in changing the pattern of living in which she was stuck. Uh, by the way, her daughter's behavior became less bothersome. <laughs> Seemed to result, we never talked about her daughter anymore. Um, as we continued in therapy, her defensiveness decreased and she grew in her ability to take responsibility for her own thoughts, feelings, and actions. And, and it was just really observable that things had shifted. And one way this transformation became evident was that when her husband joined therapy, she encouraged him to deal with his own issues instead of coming to help her or instead of focusing on her intimacy problems, which was really quite remarkable and a big shift in their relational experience. Proved very fruitful. As an aside, <clears throat> Jane continued this forgiving ritual in a really creative way. She decided to bring more closure to the effects of her father's sexual abuse by burning the letter and scattering those ashes along the shores of the lake where her father's body, cremated body, had been disseminated. She wanted to make sure that somehow he was close to those words. Okay, we'll comment more about that in a bit. So the second clinical encounter is with someone I'll call Betty. Um, this involved a middle-aged woman who had been married to her husband for 20 years. They had three teenage children. Her presenting problem concerned how her sexual past was harmfully affecting her current experience of sexuality. As a young girl, she was also sexually molested by a male relative. And during her teenage and young adult years, she allowed herself to be sexually promiscuous with numerous men. She had been sexually faithful to her husband, but since there was something missing in, there was in their intimacy and sexual relationship. Betty also confessed to having sexual fantasies and being attracted to other men. Feelings of hurt, anger, shame, guilt, confusion pervaded her experience. She desired relief from the effects of her sexual history and a more meaningful connection with her husband. Betty was really, really motivated. One of the most motivated clients I've ever had. Always asking for homework. <laughs> uh, she journalized, uh, which I think is a very um, important facilitator in spiritual kind of processing. So she journalized regularly. She completed any homework. Uh, she began to work through her understandable feelings by acknowledging and validating them to herself and to others. Letters that held her abuser and sexual partners accountable were written. They were read at a relative's grave site or to symbolic, symbolic representatives of her sexual promiscuity. So Betty forgave the men that had taken advantage of her and distortions about herself were confronted. She began to express her feelings and needs more directly to her husband and to expose the genuine parts of herself to him. And she discovered that as she disclosed her unwanted sexual thoughts and disappointments with him, that he actually opened up and instead of rejecting her, as she had feared, she found acceptance and intimacy and he disclosed more to her, which is often the case. It was obvious because anxiety distorts it, right? Anxiety says the worst thing's gonna happen and holds people captive to that. It was obvious that change was taking place, but there was still something binding her spirit. After several months of, of psychotherapy, she exclaimed that while she could forgive her abusive relative, guys that took advantage of her and her husband, she just couldn't forgive herself for being sexually promiscuous. And this was the crux of her impasse to healing. So I asked her to close her eyes and imagine where this knot of shame and regret resided in her body. And the burden of her guilt was stuck in her abdomen. 
And as she attempted to relax and yet focus on the bondage within her being, she slid her feet from her shoes, I think in an effort to just be more comfortable. And so I made this statement. I wasn't even thinking. I just said, you must be on holy ground. Um, and at that moment, something miraculous occurred. Betty visibly relaxed her body. This, I, I really can't describe this very well, but... Here's my meager attempt. Her face, which had been creased with tension, became clear and calm. Her lips parted, her mouth opened. Betty sighed a deep breath. Her abdomen lifted, her chest expanded, her head looked as though it was floating upward. A huge smile that suggested peace, contentment, relaxed her countenance. And it looked as though she was glowing with this mysterious brightness. I just shut up, because that's what you do. <laughs> when you don't know what's going on, and I didn't want to wreck the moment. I, I felt the presence of grace, a strong spiritual force that seemed to transform that office into the heavenly realms. Time stood still. I waited. I felt happy, amazed, full of wonder. It was a very sacred moment. So after a while, and I have no idea how long, Betty opened her eyes and said, It is gone. I'm forgiven. And I asked her to describe what had happened. She said that she did not have the words, but she would try. She reiterated how she believed that she had experienced a visitation from God, who lovingly came down and gently but firmly relieved her of her burden of guilt. She heard the words, my grace is sufficient, you are forgiven. And she exclaimed, or explained that she was trying to let go, but she couldn't, and God unlocked the chains of her self-condemnation. She just couldn't hold on to it any longer. They described her experience as being cleansing, euphoric, transcendent, extremely meaningful, life-changing. Uh, I've done work on peak experience before. Clearly, this was a peak experience. Um, she felt full of joy, well-being. She felt holy and complete. Betty was overwhelmed with gratefulness and awe over what had occurred. Ultimately, she was free. So Betty walked out of my office with a lightness of being that was very observable. She had passion that she hadn't had before. And her husband called a week later to ask if he could come in and maybe get one of these experiences, which, you know, <laughs> doesn't quite work that way. Uh, and as Maslow points out, peak or spiritual experiences just happen. You can't concoct them. When Betty came for her next session, which pretty much was uh, the last session because transformation had taken place. I mean, we were done. Uh, she asked me why I had said, you're on holy ground. And I lamely referred to the Old Testament story of Moses, who was instructed to move his shoes in front of the burning bush because he was on holy ground. But the truth was that those words just came out. I just said them. Um, and she believed that those words facilitated her opening up to the transcendent or to God. And upon reflection, I wonder how many weeks of psychotherapy that spontaneous spiritual intervention had replaced. So she gave me a poem um, <clears throat> at the end. It's called Letting Go. Letting Go is about breaking the chains that tie you up inside, releasing the captive self you've been punishing, relinquishing the grip fear has on you, giving up the need to control your emotions, ending the lies you tell yourself, freeing yourself of the power of the past, getting unstuck from discontent, enabling yourself to grow, empowering yourself to change, increasing your vulnerability before another, strengthening your ability to be intimate with another, allowing yourself to be healed, embracing forgiveness for yourself, extending forgiveness to others, opening up to grace. So, <clears throat> um, those are two really powerful accounts uh, of spiritual experience in psychotherapy. So here are some implications. Um, as mentioned earlier, the goals of psychotherapy are to gain spiritual or, sp or meaning or spiritual direction, to find more personal wholeness by discovering connection to God and the transcendent, and to remove those impediments that prevent healing and growth. So let's look at some of this <clears throat> in light of uh, the case studies. So let's talk about forgiveness and some of the connected features. 
In psychotherapy, the essence of forgiveness is freeing the heart from bitterness, resentment, and vendetta so that it's open to love and growth. I think forgiveness is an act of the will. I think that's a key thing. It's a choice. So it's an act of the will that chooses to release the control that the wound and that the offender has in the person. So the person who is hurt chooses healing and thus forgiveness as his or her own task. It is not dependent upon remorse, owning responsibility, compensation, or punishment on the part of the offender. Uh, the choice to forgive opens the door to emotional healing, which is always desirable, and to reconciliation if it is safe, prudent, or even possible. Forgiveness is a spiritual experience that leads to trans spiritual transformation. It's important to note that responsibility is an essential component of forgiveness. Change occurs when responsibility is appropriately directed. Through forgiving her father, Jane placed the responsibility for her experience of abuse squarely on his shoulders. She encountered release from resentment, mistrust, anxiety, pain, and self-punishment that interfered in her current relationships by making her father accountable for his sin, even if he was unable to accept it. Forgiving offenders leads to freedom for victims. By accepting responsibility for her sexual choices, Betty opened herself up to experiencing forgiveness that came from beyond herself. Uh, another component of forgiveness is letting go and leaving the past behind. Um, in his book, The Rag and Muffin Gospel, author Brendan Manning discusses how spiritually mature people become like children because children have little or no past or history. Coming into loving acceptance and grace uh, means forgetting about what lies behind and being accepted as one is. Transpersonal psychologists like Maslow indicate that one of the qualities of self-actualized or spiritually mature people is that they live in the present. Spiritual healing is demonstrated by engaging in the moment because the past is forgiven and let go. M. Scott Peck, in his classic book, The Road Less Travel, states that the road to spiritual growth is a process of letting go and taking hold. So by letting go of the effects of non-forgiveness, Jane and Betty could take hold of healing and growth. Are we? Are we? We started late, but I'll, I'm almost done. Okay. Rituals also enhance spiritual transformation experiences in psychotherapy. In fact, Ingersoll asserted that a ritual is often the mark of a spiritual experience. Uh, for example, letters uh, and read, being read and burned and so on. Uh, these rituals mark the ending of pain and a new beginning to love and hope again. And the creativity, the poetry and original actions that was evident in these rituals, I think is also an expression of spirituality. And here's something I've discovered. As people grow in their psyche and spirit, more creative expression and spontaneous inspiration naturally occur. It just seems to happen. It's one of the ways you can tell that something's going on. Perhaps it's because they're closer to God. But one of the things I like about rituals is that they can be dated and used as a reminder, a marker point. This date, something happened. It's a reference. Psychotherapeutic agents, hope and care. Um, so let's talk about hope. Hope gives direction and meaning to therapy. I discovered in Spanish the verb for hope, and I can't speak Spanish, but esperia, I don't know how to say it also means to wait. This is where trust in the therapist, God, or the therapeutic process occurs. Trust means delaying gratification because you have hope that the good outcome will come in time, after the hard work of facing the truth about yourself. So when Jane completed her therapy with me, she gave me a card, and one of her written statements was, thank you for believing me until I could believe in myself. Uh, and I recalled that I had affirmed her for coming, and, and I think I had actually said, I have hope for you. And it was as though she had borrowed my hope until she regained her own. 
Hope is a spiritual gift that empowers us to see others not merely as they are, but as they could be. I think it's an important thing to instill in therapy. Care. Care is another spiritual ingredient for psychotherapy. I don't know if you've read Gerald May's book, Simply Sane, Spirituality and Mental Health. It's an old book. He revised it about 10 years ago. Uh, great book. He suggests that growth and healing are neither events or interventions, but processes that are allowed to happen naturally. For therapists or participants in the process who sacrifice control of therapy to spiritual experience. So recall Betty. She encountered the spiritual presence of God's grace and forgiveness. I was merely an observer. I felt the encounter as a caring attendant to the process. I certainly didn't make the event happen. So as a therapist, I'm not healing another, but I bring the problem or injury to, in May's words, a more natural state, a cleansing and purifying, by cleansing and purifying and allowing rest so that healing can take place. It's like doctors, he talks about that. Uh, then openness to the divine intervention. One of my assumptions was that God could intervene in the life and the lives of human beings. And so when a sudden appearance of change inducing influence comes from beyond the client, I attribute this to God. Often this influence is much less vivid and dramatic than the one Betty experienced. Um, but frequent and frequently these experiences are more subtle, occur in smaller sacred moments over time. But all who experience those experiences report a sense of change being initiated from beyond themselves. So we could engage with the supernatural with practices like prayer and relaxation and so on. Um, but I think it's just really an openness to understand that the transcendent is amongst us. And uh, we can't orchestrate his intervention. Anderson says that therapists who are attentive to the possibility of divine intervention take on a more contemplative stance, a more listening or observing posture. And finally, um, as a result of my experiences, I often engage in a number of practices in order to increase my own openness to perceiving the advent of the transcendent. So one of the things I do is um, as I'm listening, I often ask myself, how would God listen and respond to this situation? Uh, I've also discovered that I've increased my sensitivity to the intuitive voice, which means I'm less afraid or intimidated to suggest something that might seem unusual. Because it might come uh, from a transcendent source. And um, I also need to or also remind myself that I need to let go of coming up with interventions and allow God to provide direction. This helps me to release my own change for agenda so clients can occur so that change can occur naturally. And other times I look at them and I say, I have hope for you to myself. I care for you. And I'm very conscious of the healing process of forgiveness when it's timely and appropriate. Jonathan Edwards wrote this great statement several hundred years ago, and I'll just remind you of it. Spirituality is less a method than an attitude, a posture of one's being that allows seeing not different things, but seeing everything differently. So as psychotherapists and academics, I think we might benefit from relinquishing our desire to fully explain and control the mysterious aspects or experience of chosen to control the mysterious experience of change and growth. Our clients would be the ultimate benefactors. And I like the way Gerald May stated the challenge. Mastery must yield to mystery. I know we're out of time. Yeah, we are. I want you to speak about love. Love. Love is a good thing. So, thank, thank you. you. And if you would like to connect more, we can talk, or you can email me at that address. Somewhere.